Um, so I'm going to take a break from that lovely mood and um, uh, try to present you first with something that I think will break through all of the neurons that each of us has that are telling us all the times that we cannot tell stories like this, that we cannot tell stories about families coping with reality at the end of life without uh, being too depressing, without turning people off, and without going into the dumper at the box office. Um, and I'm going to start by showing you a trailer. So, okay, so just click on the turn, and now do it again. And now, yeah. That. Okay. I believe we have a choice in this world about how to tell sad stories. On the one hand, you can sugarcoat it. Well, nothing is too messed up that can't be fixed with the Peter Gabriel song. I like that version as much as the next girl does. It's just not the truth. This is the truth. Hey, make some friends. Sorry. My bad. I'm Augustus Waters. I've been in remission for about a year and a half. Maybe you'd like to share some of your fears with the crew. Fears? Oblivion. What's your name? Hazel. What's your full name? Hazel Grace Lancaster. Why are you staring at me? Because you're beautiful. So, what's your story? I was diagnosed when I was 13. Oh, yeah. Your real story. I am quite an extraordinary. I reject that at the hand. You look at us all the time. We're just friends. I hope you realize you're trying to keep your distance from me in no way lessens my affection for you. Yes, I'm a grenade. One day I'm going to blow up and I'm going to obliterate everything in my wake and I don't want to hurt you. You don't get to choose if you get hurt in this world, but you do have a say in who hurts you. I am in love with you, Hazel Grace. And I know that love is just a shout into the void and that oblivion is inevitable. And I am in love with you. All your efforts to keep me here, you're going to fail. deal with uh, the belief that we can't talk about how we want to live at the end of life the belief that certainly young people kids don't want to talk about dying um, and um, there's nothing tougher after all than teenage death and uh, the belief that again it's a complete loser at the box office and I want to remind you that when the fall in our stars well, was released in June it outperformed uh, Tom Cruise's uh, bestseller. Uh, the first weekend, it uh, did $48 million in, in uh, domestic sales, while Tom Cruise's movie did uh, $29 million. So as, um, as Lachlan has told you, and as uh, 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 Sandra did as well, one of the things that we all know is that we are all mortal, that indeed, death rate does hold steady at 100%. Um, and uh, uh, this is not exactly a news flash, and it's not going to ruin your evening by finding this out. But the fact is, too, that too many of us are not dying in the way that we would choose, and too many of our survivors are left depressed, guilty, and uncertain about whether they have done the right thing and that this is something that we have to change. Now, as Sandra told you, I am a, what I think of as a recovering journalist. And the fact is that everybody has a story. I, even as a journalist, I've never seen anything like this. I tell people that I've helped found the Conversation Project uh, to encourage conversations about how we want to live at the end of life. 
and there's kind of half a beat, and then out comes a story. And it's usually a story of a good death or of a hard death, but I mean everybody has a story, and those stories may be decades old or they can be days old, but they are as powerful really in the experience of people's lives. And it reminds me very much of the women's movement in that sense, because what happened in the women's movement is that every woman had an experience of discrimination or of harassment, but they thought they were the only one. And it was only when those stories were shared that change began to happen. And that's where we are now with end-of-life wishes, with talking about the care we want, the care that we don't want. And that's why we're really here tonight talking to all of you because you are our culture's storytellers. I mean, let's be serious. This is what you are, and we really need to tell a very different story than the one that we are telling now about how we can live at the end of our lives that fits the narrative of our, our lives. Um, and I started the conversation project, of course, because I had a story. <laughs> uh, when I turned 60, I went from being a working mother to being a working daughter. Uh, my mother began a long, slow decline. And my mother and I had talked about everything. I once described her in a piece I wrote as a person who had listened to me talk about my problems until I was bored. So <laughs> we had talked about everything that is except how she wanted to live at the end of life. The closest we had come to that discussion was when she would see somebody in a very bad condition and she would say, if I'm ever like that, pull the plug. But of course, when the time came, there was no plug to pull because there rarely is, despite what we may see on the average show. Um, and so toward the end of her life, she had dementia and she could no longer decide really what she wanted for lunch, let alone what she wanted for health care. And I was left making a cascading number of decisions for which I assure you I was unprepared uh, indeed blindsided. And I still remember that time when I was on deadline and I got another call from her doctor at the assisted living saying to me that my mother had another bout of pneumonia and did I want her to have antibiotics. And I, and I sat there frozen and my head tipped and saying, what are they asking me? Do I want her to live or die? You know, could, could I call you back? <laughs> um, and many months later, when in fact she, she did die, I remember beginning to talk with other people and realizing, indeed, everybody did have a story and that there had to be a way for us to make it easier because so often those stories and the way people felt depended on whether they had talked about what their wishes were with the person who was coming to the end of their time. So we eventually founded the Conversation Project, which is indeed a public engagement campaign to have people's wishes for end-of-life care, the care they want, the care that they don't want, to have those wishes both express and respect both parts of that. And our goal really is to change the cultural norm from not talking about how we want to live at the end of life to talking about it, a fairly simple and yet a audacious and uh, compelling a project. Our, our belief is that we have to bring change from outside <coughs> the healthcare system by encouraging conversations at the kitchen table, not God help us, in the ICU, mm -hmm. and before there is a crisis. <coughs> so we launched with a website, we launched with a conversation starter kit, I think we have some outside that's really user-friendly and very simple. You do not need a medical degree, with all due respect, to uh, go through our conversation starter kit. Um, it it's asks you about values. It asks you about what matters to you, not what's the matter with you. Uh, there is no checklist on earth that you can fulfill for everything you're going to come up again, but you can find out what matters to people and what they care about. We've had well over a quarter of a million people download our starter kit since then. 
We have a grassroots project that is involved that we didn't even expect to get into, but communities started to come to us and ask us to bring the conversation project to people where they live, where they work, and where they pray. So we have community initiatives with about 140 groups in 32 states. And um, you know we've have been we've had a, a strong media presence as well. I want to say that last uh, fall we did a survey, and we did a survey that showed that 90% of American people know it's important to have these conversations. Now 90% of American people do not agree on anything, <laughs> including the national anthem. <laughs> Um, but only 30% have had these conversations. So our goal has been to figure out ways to close that gap so that people get these conversations onto their adult checklist of responsibilities. And that's really why we're here with all of you. The, the entertainment media, after all, changed the culture around drunk driving, changed the culture or made smoking a kind of aberration. Uh, and made huge differences in cultural attitudes towards homosexuality and certainly towards the fastest change in my lifetime, which has been same-sex marriage. So all of those things have happened with cultural change that has been supported by stories in, uh, uh, on the big and the small screen. And we know that you can change this norm, and we know just to give you a small example of how distorted the image is now, just to give you one small example, on the big and the little screen, two-thirds of the people who have CPR walk out of the hospital. In real life, it's less than 10%. So we are telling distorted stories now that really don't help people. We also hope that you can weave these family conversations um, into the stories that you do tell. We can show families, after all, whether it is modern family or parenthood, where, by the way, it's been a storyline of the grandfather having a heart, uh, heart operation and the daughter having breast cancer, and nobody has yet in that family had the conversation. Um, and I work um, with those writers. I will talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the placement that we, we should have. A, a modern family, and of course, Dan will tell you about blue bloods. Um, we can certainly show medical students who are getting no training in having these conversations, struggling to talk to their patients and to each other. And we can show the kind of family disputes and disruptions, the good deaths and the hard deaths, and model really the way we can make this universal experience better. Um, by the way, we are also holding a national dinner party the first week in January um, with, with our partners called Death Over Dinner. Uh, and um, you can go onto our website. We're doing it with a lot of celebrity chefs we, who have given us both their, we have an e-cookbook and they've given us both their stories and their recipes of comfort food to go with it. Um, they're wonderful, actually. They've been so great. So in short, um, I, I think it, this is the moment for this kind of change. We've declared, finally, the death of the death panels. There's all kinds of uh, change afoot. And my generation changed the way we give birth in America. It was not doctors who said, you know, Please take your feet out of the stirrups, bring your husband into the birthing room, you know, bring your video camera, let's have the baby in a bathtub, you know. <laughs> it was really families who said this is a human experience. And what we are saying, if we change the way we give birth in America, we can change the way we die because dying is also a human experience and we have to make it a much more humane experience. So we ask for your help in doing that.